creators of humanity within the woo-woo world are frequently seen as the Anunnaki, uh, which were these group of individuals that came on down and gave us, um, uh, Anunnaki actually means those who come from the sky. And uh, they in interacted with the Sumerians and they brought in some level of knowledge and they claimed to be our creators. Now, there's a conflicting myth the conflicting myth, uh, very much like the one about the Anunnaki, also has historical records. So, for instance, uh, if you go and you look at some of the um, writings that uh, now constitute the Bible and you look at it in their original languages, you find that some of the words we've got there are very poorly translated and were done so to uh, create a fog in the human mind. And so there's a word in the Bible that's translated as Holy Spirit. Um, or Holy Ghost. And in fact, that word is Rauch. And it is a very explicit word that means that which can fly over water as well as land. And uh, it relates to the Anunnaki. Now, we have a lot of um, archaeological evidence that the Anunnaki actually visited us. We don't have any, and we have some archaeological evidence that says that they actually um, altered our genetics but we don't have anything saying that they are in fact the original creators. That archeological evidence that we have about the Anunnaki in all of its um, uh, various different uh, branches is relatively recent in history. By relatively recent, we might be talking uh, anywhere from 200,000 to maybe a million years back. But prior to that, there, there existed, uh, or there exists evidence in archeology span of a, of a competing creator myth. This competing creator was known as the Nummo. And the Nummo uh, are, it's a name for a species. And, and this species is uh, reputed uh, by those tenuous uh, archeological uh, hints we have, most of them coming from Sanskrit, that it's reputed to be uh, about eight to 12 million years back at least. And so the Nummo would predate the Anunnaki by some, some uh, serious amount of uh, time. Now, the Nummo um, and the Anunnaki were known to each other. And that's relatively recent uh, understanding. And it comes from the indigenous peoples that surround the uh, Pacific Ring of Fire. These individual indigenous peoples have a greater history of, a, of an intact oral tradition than other indigenous peoples because they have been less conquered, less abused, et cetera. And you find that the stuff that the um, uh, Salish people around here, for instance, or the Maori in uh, New Zealand, or the uh, Melanesian peoples in the islands in the South Pacific, they all have a myth about uh, basically the Nummo and the Anunnaki being uh, contenders uh, or at war with each other. And one was referred to as the star people, that would be the Nummo, and then the sky people would be the Anunnaki. Mm -hmm. and, and they were known to be um, uh, in contention that we would think of perhaps as a long-running war or something. And uh, the people of the indigenous populations around the Ring of Fire have an extra tradition, a little bit of a wrinkle thrown in there that said that they knew the sky people were lying. And the sky people claiming to be our creators were lying. And so the indigenous people didn't have a whole lot of respect and didn't want to muck about with the sky people, the Anunnaki. And so they were at war with the, the sky people. And there's many different individual myths in the Pacific coast and especially the, the Pacific Northwest of North America, um, Salish uh, and Dinglet peoples about individuals within their tribes being kidnapped by the sky people in various reactions among the tribal members. In one particular um, uh, very sort of famous case within the Salish, there was an individual that was kidnapped by the sky people, by the Anunnaki, and the ship didn't take off right away and the uh, tribe assaulted the spaceship and was able to rescue the fellow. 
and it always struck me listening to it that it would just make a marvelous movie, mm. um, you know, because of, of the relative primitive, so to speak, trying to fight the, uh, the more sophisticated Anunnaki and then actually being successful. But let's get back to the Nemo. Uh, the Nemo are, are we, have the, we have representations of the Nemo that literally can be found on all continents excepting uh, Antarctica. We don't know that you can find them there or not because we're not allowed to share any information out of Antarctica. But all the other continents have little statuettes, boss reliefs, paintings on rocks, extensive painting in caves of the Nummo. And what is characteristic about the Nummo is that from our viewpoint, they were very ugly. Mm. Uh, they're amphibians. Uh, the Nummo are explicitly described as amphibians, where 98% of them at any given time are female. Uh, the Nummo are explicitly described as being able to change their gender in order to uh, accommodate the needs of the species and themselves uh, in reproduction. So they're not always 98% female, and they have the ability to be uh, uh, gender transforming as is required. Um, and the Nummo share certain characteristics that no matter if you're being told about them from the Melanesians, from the Maori, from the Salish, they were all described as, boy, that's a, you know, pretty ugly dude. <laughs> but also, they're, they're water-based beings. And uh, they um, uh, spend most of their time in water, and they had a very difficult time uh, walking across land. They have what we might think of as like... Um, a seal kind of feet that are flippers as well, and but don't really separate out into into legs uh, that much, and so they had difficulty actually trans uh, trans moving themselves across uh, rough surfaces like the land, and so they were uh, in the Melanesian tradition as well as the the, the um, Dogon out of Africa, they were known to use these things that were called shoes. Now, the shoes that they used were little flying platforms that actually transported them across the, the ground. And, but in the process, they got hot. The shoe got hot. And so it could set things on fire. So there were um, agreements worked out uh, with the Nummo, who didn't want to cause fires, and the local populations for areas that they cleared out so that we wouldn't have forest fires and stuff from these guys coming to visit us. But the Nummo are very interesting because the, um, the creation myth of the Nummo um, holds that the Nummo owes us a debt and that they created humanity because of a big screw up that one of their own guys actually created. And it gets, gets really deep in saying that, you, go ahead. I, and I, I certainly don't want to interrupt your thought. I just want to let you know that I didn't, <laughs> folks, this is really funny. Um, so I started recording just as you started to speak. Thank goodness, not, we got, we're going to get to hear everything that you said, but pretty much um, I didn't record my intro. So ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you guys only knew how nervous I was interviewing, I, it would, it would kind of make sense, but I'm very thankful that the only thing that I forgot to record was uh, my intro. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to jump right back into it. Cliff, hi. Uh, halfpasthuman.com, the web bot. <laughs> there, we, there we go. That's good we're enough. Good. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, and so um, I, we are talking to Cliff today about the Nummo people, that this essentially this creation story. So please continue. Right. <laughs> okay. So the, you can actually find, uh, if you're a member of the British royal family, uh, or in some way connected to them, you can get uh, detailed written explanations of the Nummo and the creation of humans that are kept away from the rest of humanity. <clears throat> and the, uh, the queen and her offspring have rituals that commemorate the Nummo, creating, <clears throat> it actually even goes deeper than that because it commemorates the, um, quote, accident that, that caused the Nummo to be in our debt. And uh, basically what happened is that the, uh, the Nummo came to the planet here, and they took some um, uh, DNA samples and stuff, and then they went away, and then they came back, and they brought back with them um, eight individuals that we would think of as like proto-humans, okay, very, very um, distinctly genetically engineered humans, and they were going to build a uh, a race uh, on this planet, uh, uh, humanity on this planet with those eight individuals. And the problem is that they, they made the um, 
uh, the humans in their own image. And so they could be either f female or male. This you'll find expressed as one of the core tenets of masonry, is that uh, we're seeking to return to that state where we are both, uh, or and or. Um, and so uh, a lot of the, the Nummo myth is encoded in masonry. It goes back into the secret societies, et cetera. But in any event, in the, in the British royals um, tradition of it, um, they tell the story in a, in a very complete sort of a fashion, uh, not 100%, but uh, pretty close. And they align themselves with the guy who really screwed up and caused that debt to exist. And basically what happened was that they brought back um, uh, uh, eight uh, individuals. And um, of those eight individuals, two of the individuals fell in love. And um, they, uh, the, two of those individuals uh, were able to um, breed, uh, but they, they did it um, out of season, so to speak, relative to how the Nummo think of these things. And so the offspring, um, uh, uh, when they got back to earth here with those eight individuals, uh, one was already pregnant and the issue was already known. And then that, that individual gave birth here on this planet and produced this um, mentally disturbed offspring. And time goes by, no more busily doing their creation thing here on the, on the planet. And that individual, the mentally disturbed offspring, uh, ends up uh, as a young adult stealing one of the Nummo spaceships. Now, um, it then, okay, so you have to know a certain thing about the Nummo. The Nummo are not like the Greys, and they're not like the Anunnaki. The Nummo spaceships, uh, at, they may at this time be different, but way back when, actually went through the interstellar medium. Okay, they actually took the time and, and sort of flew from star to star as opposed to transiting uh, outside of time, interdimensionally, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, so uh, they were very unique. They could move through space the same way stars do. And their ships were powered by and, and led by a, a glowing ball of liquid copper uh, that had been highly energized, that basically acted as their a little sun, and it sort of drugged the rest of the spaceship along with them through space. Uh, through the interstellar media, which is not a vacuum. Anyway, um, this is pertinent because when this individual stole one of the Nummo spaceships, didn't know what it was doing, it flew up into the atmosphere and then came back down and crashed. And the whole of planet Earth was polluted by that liquid copper engine crashing back on Earth. The Nummo very hastily uh, got the eight individuals that they had created and all of their crew into their spaceship along with their uh, cubes, uh, which were their record, their uh, ability, a crystal cube that they used to store things. Mm -hmm. And that held the, um, all of the DNA on all of the creatures that they'd examined to that date on Earth. And so it was Noah's Ark. It had all of the DNA for everything on, in this little tiny cube. Anyway, uh, so they gathered all that stuff up, got into their spaceships, and, and left, or moved off of the planet. They didn't leave the area, though, because they knew they had to do something. And so they extinguished the copper fire, and um, then they uh, went away to think about the damage that had been created here. Bear in mind that most of the life on Earth was destroyed. Plant life, bacteria, everything was just destroyed by this incredible level of um, um, space pollution, so to speak. And so when the Nummo, the Nummo go away, but they're very, very, very moral. These are beings that, that um, have the ability to do transmigration of soul. They can seek enlightenment. They have a soul, unlike many of the other aliens that we will encounter. And the Nummo were uh, bound by that soul to a level of morality of ahimsa, do no harm. And one of, one of the things they had created had done immeasurable harm to earth. So some time passes. We don't know how much time. Uh, and it's sort of immaterial. And the Nummo come back because they've got a plan. And uh, from, from that point on, we pick up our story uh, from like the Salish people or the Dogon people who were deep in Africa at that time. Now, bear in mind that in, in um, 
in all cases here, we have scientific evidence that could not have been known by primitive tribes without external influence. So they knew there was a, that the Nummo came from Sirius. They knew that there was a Sirius Sun A, a Sirius Sun B, and a little tiny Sirius Sun C. We didn't discover the third Sirius Sun in that cluster until just mm, probably 80 years ago or less. And yet they, the Dogon and the Salish knew of that and had a specific word for it. They could tell you proportion-wise how big it was to the other stars. It could tell you how it all orbited. All of these mechanics that we're just now figuring out. So they knew. In any event, though, so uh, the Nummo come back. And, and some time passes. The Nummo come back, and they basically spray all of Earth with a foam. And this was the foam that cleared away the copper pollution. And it is from there that we get our world girdling uh, flood myths because they flooded the planet with this foam that had been, let's say, as carefully engineered as they could to get rid of the pollution, but not uh, necessarily kill off everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like covering the whole planet with Drano in order to scrub it all off. It was very much more subtle than that. And they apparently had to engineer uh, this and that took them some time. But they came back with their um, uh, eight individuals and uh, set about, according to the Salish people here, correcting their mistake. And so the very first thing they did, according to the Salish, was that they, um, uh, they're aquatic beings. And so they started creating creatures that could fill the oceans again. And one of the things that they created was salmon. And they did so specifically such that the land creatures would have something to eat. And then the, the Salish story is picked up with the narrative of the uh, raven, because the raven was the first of the land creatures that was created by the Nummo and was a constant companion to the Nummo as, the, as they went around the planet undoing all the problems and fixing things. Mm -hmm. And so we have as an expositor in uh, the Salish myths, we have Raven, the, tr the trickster, who tells us what the Nummo did and how they did it and, and how they would always have to be close to streams and need to get in water all the time and uh, could talk with the, the whales and the, and the fish and so on. And, the, and the, also the expositor of the Raven here discusses the soul debt that the Nummo have with humanity. Now, I actually believe we are the Nummo, okay? That the Nummo created us uh, in, a, in a loose sense of the word in their own image. Mm -hmm. We're not as ugly as the Nummo. We're not amphibian. We're not um, uh, by gender at will, uh, but we have something that they have, and that is the ability to uh, have a soul and to be able to reincarnate and seek enlightenment. Now, we don't do it the same way as they did, okay? Because the Nummo were capable of simply producing an offspring, a whole new life form, but they were also capable of producing their own next body. And so they would, they would uh, basically get pregnant and go through a specific process. And then as they died, that, um, they would do the transmigration of the soul and give birth at the same time. And so they would come out with all their own knowledge and so on. We don't have that, but they did the best that they could for us. Now, another aspect of the Nummo myth uh, that from which we get all of these other um, memes is that the Nummo swore they would return to us and that they would come and see us again when we had discovered who we were. Okay, and it wouldn't do any good to come back prior to that because they, the interaction with the Nummo and ourselves was intended so that they could instruct us as to how to work the whole reincarnation kind of thing, right? How to seek enlightenment effectively. And uh, also in the, in the uh, myth here locally in Pacific Northwest is the uh, first place I'd ever seen it is the discussion that the Anunnaki are extremely long-lived, okay? Mm -hmm. But they don't have a soul. They're not able to reincarnate but they have an extremely long life. Nummo, on the other hand, are sold beings and can reincarnate as they choose, uh, but are, are, are essentially immortal, but not immortal. Uh, they're eternal. And, and so they're not really immortal. The Anunnaki think of themselves as immortal, that if they can keep their bodies going, they might easily live you know, tens of thousands of years. Uh, whereas the Nummo don't even try and do that. They're simply eternal 
going through various different bodies the same way we are. And so we're eternal beings going through various different bodies. Now they had to do a lot of different things to get our consciousness, to get consciousness shoved into humanity. So this is where it gets into some really deep woo-woo, because if you look, ex if you examine humans, uh, we're essentially a primate, and as a, as a mammal and a primate, we share with all other mammals uh, a certain uh, physiology that is um, a unique to vertebrates. So 85% of the life on this planet that's um, animal has no spine. They're not vertebrates. Only 15% of the population of the planet is vertebrates. Uh, a very interesting thing if you, if you think about evolution being the cause of all of this. But in any event, as vertebrates, we have a highly complex vagus nervous system. And so if you strip off all of our flesh and get rid of all of the bones and just have the nerve system there, you'll see that we actually have two complete nervous systems one of which runs through the body, uh, goes through the spinal cord, and so on. And then we have this curious alien kind of a thing that wraps around our, all of our vital organs, touches the glands in the, in the head, connects to the, the four senses that we've got in our cranium, and it is the vagus nervous system. And it goes all the way down, and it connects to your gut. Uh, it connects to all of the major organs of the body except for the adrenals. And uh, in so doing, it does more than simply connect them. It, it's a transmitter. So bacteria in your stomach produce serotonin, which is taken up by the vagus nervous system and then put to your brain. And so... Um, that was thunder. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so the, um, the, you know, it's actually very uh, understandable that things like vaccinations at a very young age that trash your, your gut biome and kill off a lot of your bacteria and even vast quantities of antibiotics would do this, uh, alter your brain state because you don't have those serotonin producing bacteria in your gut anymore. And so you get depressed. So a lot of the gut issues uh, affect the brain. And, and we have all of these weird connections between our physiology at, at the level of the gut bacteria and our mental health. Everything from ADHD to autism to uh, depression, all of these things can be at some level uh, pegged to what's going on in our, in our stomachs. Mm. But the, the NUMO, um, being aquatic beings, uh, engineered us more towards the aquatic, okay? We find a great deal of, uh, if we get, read into the um, cuneiforms, the, the Sumerian, about the Anunnaki, or even into the, some of the African legends about the Anunnaki, we find that these be beings were very uncomfortable with water that they were um, not 98% water like we are. They're very much more um, desiccated, I guess you'd have to say. They just didn't have that much. But they also had, the, had problems because they had never really had to engineer uh, anything around water until they'd gotten here. Now, apparently, according to the Salish and some of the other tribes around uh, the Pacific Rim, the war between the Anunnaki and the uh, Nemo is more of a jealousy kind of thing. The Anunnaki are following along behind the Nemo and, and basically wherever possible, I guess, trying to capitalize on it. And they do know something about genetics. Uh, so we have, for instance, Anunnaki descriptions that can be found in the Maya, uh, in the Mesoamerican ruins and so forth. That is very similar to what you see in the Sumerian, but they're talking about different Anunnaki guys. And so apparently what went on um, was that some aspect of the war uh, between um, the Anunnaki, who were apparently very combative, and some other group. It may not have been the Nummo, we just don't know. But sometime in, in the past in our solar system, uh, the fifth planet was destroyed, and it became our uh, asteroid belt. And in that process, that's when the Anunnaki were thrown down onto the earth. And we have the idea of the angels being cast down from heaven. And it was because the Anunnaki couldn't get the hell out of off the planet. And they had uh, big issues there. So they, uh, the number of the Anunnaki was small. Their power was great. But you need lots of things in order to build a spaceship. And so you need to ha have a very large, complex social order to support that whole effort.
And thus we see that the uh, Anunnaki that had crashed or landed in Mesoamerica set about designing uh, their workers a particular way. Uh, those that were in Africa had a, another angle on it. And those in the Middle East had a, had a third angle. And thus we end up with all of the races of humanity that are a little different from it all, uh, from, from each other. And if we go all the way back and go back up to the British royals again, we find out that they've got this magic stone that the queen or king is required to sit on in Wales and has to recite this arcane language to their siblings that tells them this story. It's just one of their rituals. And in that story, they say that they are the um, offspring of that original breeding pair that produced the mentally infirm individual that caused it all. As if and, that's something to take pride in. But as though, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, because they can say, well, our lineage goes all the way back to the prime pair. Right. Mm -hmm. The first psychopath ever to planet <laughs> Earth, absolutely. Right. <laughs> right, but they're number one. They're number right. one. We're, yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, though, so it's, yeah, it's quite, um, uh, quite fascinating about the Nemo and, um, and the Anunnaki. And I, I, in the, I take great pains to bring this story up because so many people that they come into the woo-woo world, they hear about the Anunnaki, it's relatively built up and so on in terms of the storyline, and they think it ends right there. Uh, but we go way back beyond that. Now, we have actual uh, out-of-place artifacts that would tend to support the uh, view of the Nummo being the uh, uh, progenitor creators. And we have such weirdnesses as um, modern Homo sapiens sapien skeletons being found in areas where we know uh, from our science that that body could only have been put there 8 million years ago. And so uh, in uh, California, I had a lot of relatives that were involved in the gold mining business, and they would find some weird stuff down there digging uh, for gold. And in one area, because they, gold has a tendency to go with the rivers, any of the underground rivers that they would uh, come along and find these gravel deposits, they would, it's easier to dig those anyway, but also there's likely to be more gold there. And so they would go ahead and dig through these underground rivers that had long since dried up that are just basically tubes with, filled with various different levels of gravel and silt and so on. And it is in those tubes that they would discover um, modern Homo sapien skeletons with ancient animals, uh, old style uh, miniature horses, big, big dog bones, that kind of thing, where the whole village was trapped in a flood in the river and eventually found them their way, uh, you know, as bodies uh, underground. And, and you can date the bacterial activity in some of these areas back at 8 million years. So um, uh, we do have some evidentiary support for the Nummo view, uh, whereas all the Anunnaki stuff, it only goes back just a little bit so far. And it's, and it's uh, basically centered in the more sensational uh, descriptions from the Middle East. Well, and what's interesting to me is that, you know, these really mainstream programs such as Ancient Aliens and you know, a lot of these uh, sort of in-your-face disclosure types of platforms peddle the Anunnaki creation story as if it is just fact. And this is how humans came to be. We were uh, originally created as a slave race to mine gold uh, by the Anunnaki. And um, I was just wondering if you felt that there was some kind of uh, an invested interest in, in the role of, um, you know, we can call them the cabal, whatever you'd like to call them, do you think that they want us to, to, to believe that the Anunnaki were sure. the original creators? Okay, and 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 because I I have to tell you, I I've, I've heard I've seen reference like hearing you talk about the Nummo, it really all makes sense to me that there was something far far older. I never bought into the Anunnaki thing. I was like, there, there's just no way. It doesn't feel right to me. Oh, and also the um, the clergymen of the Roman Catholic Church, they wear a hat that looks a lot like the open mouth of a fish. Right. And, uh, and is that there's kind of all kinds of stuff to the aquatic beings, especially in the Catholic Church, yes. symbols under symbols under symbols. But you're quite correct about the, um, the powers that be want us all to believe the Anunnaki myth, because see, here's the thing. The, in the end, uh, first off, the Anunnaki had hierarchy. They had uh, a military organization, and they organized humanity that way. 
and they delegated authority to priests and kings and so on. And so those are the powers that be. And if we, we believe, and so it's the divine right to rule because the Anunnaki placed your ancestor in charge. Therefore, you've got the divine right to rule the rest of us. Whereas if we're all descended from Nemo, it's much more like um, individual uh, individualism rules, right? Because all Nemo were um, uh, decentralized and, uh, and unorganized. Okay, they, they were... Uh, organizational beings, but the organizations didn't dominate uh, or take on a life of their own the way that we have them here. And so they're much more, could be thought of much more as, you know, tribal or counselor kind of things as opposed to uh, some kind of a hierarchy. So yeah, you're, you're spot on with that. And um, it's, you know, it's unfortunate that we are where we are, but you know, we'll see. Humanity has its destiny. We'll learn how all this stuff shakes out. At some point, we'll know a lot more than we do now. And, we'll, you know, other individual, individuals within humanity will be able to decide which of the various creation myths um, are more compatible, more harmonious. Yeah. But uh, I agree with you that the, the, uh, there's a lot of power and money behind the selling of the Anunnaki story. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming even more so as we go along. Now, some interesting things about this, all right? Uh, the Anunnaki uh, provide us with the gods, mm -hmm. all right? So the, uh, the Jewish people describe themselves as the chosen ones. And that's actually a mistranslation of the language into English, okay? It is not that the, the Jewish people are the chosen ones. It is that they are the ones who chose. Okay, because there was a conflict between uh, Anunnaki and the uh, created slave race uh, in this particular region was allowed to choose which one of the Anunnaki uh, 